We are gathered here today to evaluate this ridiculously awesome integral. We have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of hyperbolic cosine or cosh of x times the cosine of the hyperbolic sine or sinh of x dx. And recently I released a video solving a trig trig integral which was pretty dope. And this is similar to that, only this time we have trig hyperbolic things going on, which is also extremely cool. So let's just get straight to it. The first thing to notice is that we have sine times cosine. So this would be a good opportunity to invoke those product to sum formulae. Takes me back to, to, the, to the high school days of mine where I refused to learn even a single one of them. I, I refused to memorize a single one of them anyway and just derived everything at the spot. That was fun. Anyway, so we have sine A times cosine B equals one half of sine A plus B plus sine A minus B. So in our case, we have A equal to hyperbolic cosine or cosh and B equal to sinh of X. And the hyperbolic functions are defined quite nicely in terms of exponential functions. So let's make use of that. We have e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2. And we have e to the x, terribly sorry about that, minus e to the negative x over 2. Okay, cool. So a plus b equals e to the x plus e to the negative x plus e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. We have some lovely cancellation. And we have 2 e to the x over 2, which is, of course, e to the x. And by similar token, a minus b equals e to the negative x. So this implies that the target integral i sorts out to one half the integral from zero to infinity. Uh, what exactly? So we had sine a plus b plus sine a minus b. So that turns into sine of e to the x plus sine of e to the negative x dx. Now let's make use of the linearity of the integration operator and write this as one half the integral from zero to infinity of sine e to the x dx plus one half integral zero to infinity sine e to the negative x, terribly sorry about that, dx. Now for a couple of u substitutions for these integrals. For this one, we're going to let e to the x equal u which implies that x here equals log u, and on differentiating, we have dx equal to 1 over u du. And for the limits, as x approaches 0, we have u approaching terribly, sorry about that, 1. And as x approaches infinity, we have u obviously approaching infinity. So the first one of these integrals sorts out to 1 half the integral from 1 to infinity of sine of u over u, du. Now what about the other one? Well, you guessed it, the transformation is going to be e to the negative x equal u, which implies that x here equals negative log u, which further implies that dx equals negative 1 over u du. And as far as the limits go, as x approaches 0, we have u approaching 1 again, and as x approaches infinity, e to the negative x, or u, that is, approaches 0. Okay, cool. So we have plus 1 half integral 1 to 0 of sine of u over negative u du, which of course sorts out to integral 0 to 1. If we switch up the limits, we have an extra negative sign to cancel that one out. So we have 1 half factored out and integral 1 to infinity, plus integral 0 to 1, of course, sorts out to integral 0 to infinity of sine u over u du, which we all know and love as the Dirichlet integral. Now, I've solved this so many times using so many different techniques, but the video seems pretty short if I cut it over here, and the solution development using complex analysis is just gorgeous, so let's just roll with it. So now that my OCD tendency to invoke complex analysis at every single opportunity has taken over, uh, it's time to define the complex valued function f of z, and we'll define that as e to the iz over z. 
The reason for that is that if we evaluate an integral involving e to the iz, and we know from Euler's formula that e to the iz equals cosine z plus i times sine z, so we could just take the imaginary part of that integration result and we have the Dirichlet integral. Okay, cool. So e to the iz is an entire function and we have e to the iz times one over z. So this thing has a simple pole at z equal to zero. And now for the contour, we're gonna make use of the classic semi-annular contour. So we have the imaginary axis over here and the real axis as well. And we're going to draw a semicircle of radius r. So we got negative r here and positive r over there. And we're also gonna draw another semicircle of radius epsilon. So negative epsilon here, positive epsilon over there. And now let's just complete the semicircular path to give us the semi-annular contour. Okay, cool. We'll call this little semicircle lowercase gamma and this one uppercase gamma. We'll call the entire thing C. So we have the integral over the closed contour C of e to the i z over z dz. And everything here is nice and holomorphic. So by Cauchy's theorem, we know that this thing equals zero. But of course, we can break this integral down into its parts. So we have one integral from negative r to negative epsilon plus an integral over little gamma, plus an integral from epsilon to r, plus an integral over uppercase gamma, and all of this equals zero. And of course, we're interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity and epsilon going to zero. And I almost forgot to mention, we're traversing this thing in the counterclockwise sense. So let's take care of the integrals on the real line first. So we have this one here and this one here. So the integral from negative r to negative epsilon plus the integral from epsilon to r equals integral from, well, negative r to negative epsilon of e to the i x over x because we're on the real line so we can replace z by x dx plus the integral from epsilon to r of, again, e to the i x over x dx. And we're interested in the limiting case of r going to infinity and epsilon going to zero, which in our case would yield the integral from negative infinity to zero plus the integral from zero to infinity of e to the, of e to the i x over x dx, which of course yields the integral from, terribly sorry about that, negative to positive infinity of e to the i x over x dx, which is Kind of our target integral, we'll deal with the even odd function thing later, but yeah, this is what I'm gonna call my integral i for now. Now let's talk about the integral over uppercase gamma. So for any vector representing a complex number z falling on uppercase gamma, we can parameterize z as r times e to the i theta, where theta goes from zero to pi. Okay, cool. And of course, differentiating gives us dz equal to i r e to the i theta d theta. So the integral over gamma sorts out to the integral from 0 to pi of e to the i z, z now being r times e to the i theta over z, which is, again, the same thing, and dz, which is i r e to the i theta d theta. We have some lovely cancellations straight up we have the integral from zero to pi, and we have i as well, times e to the i r. e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i times sine theta. So I'll simplify that and get integral zero to pi, i times e to the i r cosine theta times e to i squared is negative one, so we have negative r sine theta d theta. Okay, cool. Now it's time to invoke one of our favorite results from complex analysis, and that is the absolute value of an integral over a contour gamma of a function f is less than or equal to the integral over the same contour of the absolute value of that very same function f. So this implies that the integral over gamma, the absolute value of it that is, is less than or equal to the integral from zero to pi 
of absolute value i times absolute value e to the i r cosine theta, terribly sorry about that, times absolute value e to the negative r sine theta d theta. So absolute value of i is just 1, and the absolute value of e to the i times some real number is also 1, and e to the negative r sine theta is always positive. So this is what I have left. And we see immediately that as r goes to infinity, terribly sorry about that, this integral goes to zero, which implies that the limit as r goes to infinity of the absolute value of the integral over gamma equals zero. And we know that the only complex number with an absolute value of zero is zero. So this implies that the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral over uppercase gamma of e to the i z over z dz equals zero, which is very convenient because we can just cross that thing out, meaning that we have only one integral left, and that is the integral over lowercase gamma. Now for lowercase gamma, we have z parameterized as epsilon times e to the i theta, where this time theta goes from pi to zero because of the clockwise sense of traversing little gamma. And dz here equals i epsilon e to the i theta d theta. So now for the integral. So integral over lowercase gamma of e to the i z over z dz equals integral from pi to zero of what exactly? e to the i epsilon terribly. Sorry about that. i epsilon e to the i theta over epsilon e to the i theta times i times epsilon times e to the i theta d theta, where again we have some lovely cancellation taking place. So we have negative i times integral 0 to pi of e to the i epsilon e to the i theta d theta. Once again we'll expand the exponential function using Euler's formula. So we have integral of e to the wait a minute, i epsilon cosine theta plus i times sine theta d theta, which yields, terribly sorry about that, negative i times integral 0 to pi e to the i epsilon cosine theta times e to the negative, because i squared equals negative 1, epsilon sine theta d theta. Okay, cool. So that's the integral over lowercase gamma, and we're interested in the limiting case of epsilon going to zero. So as epsilon goes to zero, we have e to the i zero, which is one. So we have negative integral zero to pi, one times one, which is, well, one. And we're just left with d theta, which sorts out to pi minus zero. So we have the limit as epsilon goes to zero of the integral over gamma of e to the i z over z dz equal to negative i times pi and now it's time to consolidate all our results and derive the result for the target integral. So we initially had the sum of four integrals and then we evaluated them while applying these limits and it turned out that one integral crashed down to zero and these two combine to give us our target integral, well, sort of our target integral, integral negative to positive infinity, e to the i x over x, dx, plus one integral over lowercase gamma that yielded negative i times pi, this thing equals zero, which implies that the integral from negative to positive infinity of e to the i x over x, dx equals pi, which is pretty cool. And now taking the real and imaginary parts or equating the real and imaginary parts on both sides of the equation, we have the integral from negative to positive infinity of sine x over x dx equal to pi as expected. And as far as the real part is concerned, that is the integral from negative to positive infinity of cosine x over x dx. This sort of makes sense because it's the integral of an odd function over a symmetric interval. So it does make sense that it, that it crashes down to zero, but this thing converges only in the principal value sense. In the strict sense, the integral will not converge. So I'm writing this as the principal value of that integral. Okay, cool. Now, 
sine x over x is an even function. So this implies that twice the integral from 0 to infinity of sine x over x dx is pi. So the integral from 0 to infinity is just pi over 2. And recall that our target integral, which was supposed to be called i, but I think I called that another integral along the way. Terribly sorry about that. So this implies that i, which is one half of this result, equals pi over 4, which is pretty satisfying. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.